get started. Um, today we're very pleased to have a guest speaker, uh, no guest to uh, the School of Architecture. Ralph Knowles is an emeritus professor. He taught here at USC for 43 years and is still still teaching. Ralph is also Ralph is, uh, has made a a, a, a a life work out of examining uh, the relationship of, of sun to architecture in a number of different ways and for many years have explored this uh, in the design studios and has done a lot of research. Has written a book, the, the, uh, uh, the beginning of which you've read for today. Uh, Ralph is also a former student of mine um, because he uh, learned how to uh, study uh, solar issues um, on the computer a number of years ago in the design studio. Very impressive student as well. And um, today he's going to be talking uh, about uh, Ritual House, which is the subject of, um, of his book. So, I welcome Ralph, Ralph Knowles. Yeah, maybe turn them a little bit. Tim, it's been a long time since I was your student. You stay young, I get older. <laughs> Good morning. This is a big group. You're all intending to be architects? That's good. They used to say in the first year that um, if you look to the person on your left and look to the person on the right, they'd be gone in a few years. I don't know whether they still say that. This um, lecture this morning is in two parts. The first part, Ritual House, borrows its name from uh, the book that you have read the first part to. It deals principally with the ways that people have traditionally found used sheltering rituals to attain comfort in their dwellings, minimum energy cost. The second part of the lecture, Solar City, deals with concepts of zoning cities, that is, organizing the growth of cities so that buildings don't cast shadows on each other. Within those shadows, you can't really use the sun as a source of energy or life quality. So if we're going to use the sun, we have to find some way to grow cities that provides access to the sun. Both parts of the lecture deal with how buildings use energy, and energy is a critical issue today. We're living in a time of convergence, a convergence between energy demand and worldwide urbanization. Both of these situations are unprecedented. We've never had them before. All we have to do is look at our own city of Los Angeles. Over the last century, and watch its growth. On the left is the road system in 1913. As you can see, the roads are fairly irregular. They follow old pioneer tracks, the topography. That happened to be a very critical year in the history of Los Angeles. It was a year that water was brought from the Owens Valley of California. It was also the year that Henry Ford put his assembly line on wheels so it's fair to say, it's fair to describe Los Angeles as a, water, a city of water and cars. By mid-century here, we can begin to see the impact of growth where roads start to follow the U.S. land ordinance of 1785. They run north-south and east-west predominantly. And by the end of the century, we can see that that grid, that Jeffersonian grid as it's called, the U.S. land ordinance where the streets run north-south and east-west has covered virtually all of the relatively flat land in the metropolitan region, with the exception of the mountain ranges, the San Jacinto Mountains on the southeast, the San Gabriels on the north, and the Santa Monicas on the west. 
Of course, Los Angeles is not the only city growing in the world. In 1950, there was one city in the entire world of 10 million or more people, and that was New York. By the year 2000, there were 16 cities in the world, 18 cities in the world, excuse me, of over 10, 10 million people, and one of those, Tokyo, had over 20 million. By the year 2015, it's projected that there will be 25 cities in the world of 10 million or more people, six of those over 20 million. My point is that how cities and how the buildings in cities use energy will determine to a great extent how we use energy in the world. So the question is, what do we do about it? And this is a question that is critical to you. You will be designing and building those buildings. And I would suggest that we have a lot to learn from tradition. Traditionally, there have been three sheltering rituals that people have used to maintain comfort essentially by low energy means. Migration. Can you turn that off? The rituals of migration, the rituals of transformation, the rituals of metabolism. And you read about those in that first part of the book. Let's look first at migration, simply moving around. This is a set of diagrams that a student of mine did some years ago showing how he moves through his house for comfort at different seasons of the year. It's a one-story house, so what you're looking at here are essentially the, the two-dimensional paths that he took through the house in the wintertime. He obviously doesn't use up much of the house, finding a few rooms more comfortable than the rest. In the summertime, that diagram increases in size. He's using more of the house, more of the rooms are, are uh, habitable from his point of view. And this diagram shows what happens on a special holiday. Um, this one happens to be Thanksgiving, when friends and relatives and, and neighbors come over to celebrate. They're using up not only the whole house, but they're wandering out into the yards as well. People traditionally move vertically in houses as well as horizontally. This is a house in the northwestern part of India. It's, as you can see, it's a multi-story house. It's built around a high central courtyard here with flanking courtyards on either side. We're seeing this picture as the sun enters on a summer day at midday. The sun is very high in the sky. It, it enters all the way down to the bottom of this courtyard, but it only takes about two hours to walk to, for the sun to move across the courtyard. It also enters these courtyards, but it does not enter into these perimeter living spaces. On a winter day, the sun is quite in a quite different position in the sky. It's coming in from low in the southern sky, and it's lighting and heating all the way to the back walls, these upper, these upper spaces in the house. The result of that migration of the sun is a migration of the people. You can see here on the, on the left a daily migration in the summertime. When in the hot summer day, people spend their time down here in lower spaces of the house. In the, in, on, on the summer evening, they migrate up to these upper terraces and roof levels, where the first thing that happens is that, uh, somebody gets out a hose and sprinkles water, or a watering can, and sprinkles water on the roof terraces to cool them. When that happens, of course, the, ch the children come out of the house. They love to be sprinkled. And when the sprinkling is done, they enter into a round of puddle jumping rituals. Finally, things settle down. People. Uh, settle down for night, they talk, they chat, they share the events of the day, they may tell stories and so on. So there's this daily migration in the summertime, but throughout the year there's a much more general migration, low in the house for most of the living during the summertime and higher up into the upper levels of the house in the wintertime. As well as moving around, people have traditionally transformed their dwellings in some way. This is a Berber tent in Arabia. It's in its summer mode here and its winter mode here. The difference is these tent flaps that disappear in the summertime and, they're, and uh, that are dropped and secured to the ground in the wintertime. There's also a kind of social difference here. 
In the summertime, people inside can look out, people outside can look in. The children can run in one side of the tent and out the other side, in the next tent, out the other side. So there's a kind of openness, a kind of contact uh, that goes on uh, in the summertime that does not go on in the wintertime. People live inside these, uh, these walled enclosures. It's especially maybe difficult for the children who still want to run around, jump, play, scream and holler as children everywhere do. Of course, it causes chaos in here. So at that point, the grandmothers step in for a round of storytelling rituals, telling of their own childhood, telling of the history of the, of the tribe, and so on. Sorry. And of course, windows. It's said that windows can give you a view into the heart of a soul, uh, the soul of a house. And of course, in a sense, they can. This window, the jar here, tells us that somebody occupies the house. They are care taking care of it. They're adjusting the house for comfort. Inside that same, uh, that same window, and this is a Georgian house in Edinburgh, Scotland, is this wonderful set of uh, wooden panels here that can fold out. And behind them, there is a sunscreen that can be folded across the window. In addition to that sunscreen, there's, there are curtains that can be dropped and drapes that can be pulled across. So the combination of all these things, the operable window, the sunscreens, the curtains, and the drapes, the combinations of, those, of all of those means of, of, of control uh, are considerable. They can control the amount of sunlight that enters. They can control the amount of wind that enters. They can subdue the light or encourage the light and so on. At the same time, the operable door. Open, the door suggests a kind of uh, social contact. People outside can look in and see this beautiful flower arrangement on the hall table. People inside can look out. Like the Berber tent, there's a kind of social contact, an openness um, uh, that otherwise uh, would, be that would be curtailed, would be shut out uh, by closing the door, closing the windows, by pulling the drapes, and so on. This is a house in southern Spain. It's a court, obviously a courtyard house with this wonderful fountain here that echoes off the walls. The owner of this house daily comes out and sprinkles these plants here. While he's sprinkling the plants, he sprinkles this floor that's made of absorbent tires, tiles to uh, humidify and to cool space. When he does that, as on the Indian roof, the children come out to play. They love to be sprinkled, as children everywhere do. And when the sprinkling is done, they, like the children on the Indian roof, enter into a round of puddle jumping rituals. In addition to the spraying of water for comfort, there is this device. This is called a toldo, a T-O-L-D-O. -O. It's characteristic of, uh, of uh, 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 courtyards in Mexico and uh, throughout uh, Central and South America. It's a, a, a white translucent canvas covering that is closed or opened depending on the time of the day and the season of the year. In the summertime, during the hot part of the day, it's closed to provide shade for this courtyard. But at night, it's opened up to provide cold sky radiation to cool the courtyard. In the wintertime, it's just the reverse. It's opened during the daytime to admit the warming rays of the sun, and it's closed during the night to keep the heat inside. Of course, as that toldo is open and closed, the whole space of the courtyard is transformed. When the, when, the, when the toldo is open, space extends to the sky. We see these uh, leafy branches in sharp silhouette. Shadows from these branches are cast onto the, onto the walls and onto the floor of the courtyard. When the toldo is closed, the whole quality of the space changes. This is, a, this is not a technological issue. This is a design issue. It has to do with the quality of life. It has to do with how people feel in this place. The space with the toilet closed is much quieter. You don't hear outside sound as well. It's more private. It's the lightest dude inside. You no longer see the sharp shadows of, of the open toldo. This is the minka. It's the traditional Japanese house. It's made up of uh, wooden, beam, wooden columns and beams. 
and paper panels. In the wintertime, these panels are put into place to subdivide the space of this house into relatively small compartments. Inside those small compartments, people are tightly contained. There's an advantage in the wintertime because they can share body heat, they can share the heat of a hibachi, a little charcoal burning uh, stove. But in the summertime, the house is opened up. While the space was contained, the spaces were contained and small in the wintertime, bring people together here in the summertime, space extends even out to the garden, the winds can blow through, the space is more light, people are freer to move about, they're no longer contained. They maintain eye contact with each other, but they themselves can, can follow a movement pattern that is much, much freer. And finally, there are the rituals of metabolism. It's what these two ate for breakfast or for lunch that, in addition to their warm clothing, keeps them warm. And incidentally, this is my son some years ago. He sat in the snow. At least I hope he sat in the snow. <laughs> Body heat has been traditionally used historically. This is the great jousting hall uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, fortress palace at Prague, the capital city of the Czech Republic. Now, mostly tourists are here in this space, but it, is a, it was in its heyday a great jousting hall where hundreds of people lined these long walls. A knight, a mounted knight at either end on a charger, at a signal from somebody, they charged each other with couch lances. People screamed and hollered, encouraging on their favorite. It was the heat of the hundreds of bodies, knights themselves and the horses that kept this place warm on a winter day. And the winter in, in uh, Prague can be very cold indeed. There are fireplaces at either end of this, one fireplace at either end of this uh, great hall, but it's not nearly enough to provide the comfort that's necessary. And of course, there's the fireplace, probably the most romantic of all metabolic modes. The chimney itself symbolizes hearth and home. In the wintertime, the hearth attracts people. They come there for the warmth, but they come there for socializing and for, for completing small tasks as well. That's where they tell stories. That's where they sell, sing songs. In the summertime, that hearth loses its hold. Can somebody tell me what happened here? Sorry about that. Technology is all. Anyway, in the summertime, the hearth does lose its hold. People are freer to, to move about. Their movement patterns are freer. They expand and so on. The metabolic me means today for attaining comfort are generally speaking out of sight. We depend on huge power plants that are sometimes hundreds of miles away. And we distribute energy through these kinds of systems, wires, high tension towers, and so on. The problem with those kinds of highly centralized systems is that they are vulnerable. You run into this every day if you drive the freeways. It doesn't take but a small accident, a fender bender, to tie up a, a, whole, a whole portion of the system. These systems are highly centralized, and they are, they are vulnerable. They fail because machines break down, because n nature impacts on them, windstorms, rainstorms, uh, snowstorms that knock down wires, that knock down whole high-tension towers, and finally terrorism. Uh, a concern that has come more and more into the new news today. They're also vulnerable to, to control or miscontrol the manipulation of prices and, and supply. The state of California is just getting out from under a vast debt that it incurred because of 
uh, because of unscrupulous manipulation of price and, and power supply a few years ago. And finally, such systems are inefficient. Long distance transmission uses up a lot of energy as heat. Some have estimated in some situations as high as 40% of the energy is lost in transmission. But I have to say that while there are vulnerabilities to such systems, there are also, from an architectural point of view, developed some advantages, some design freedoms that we otherwise don't have. This designer of a building, an important building in Vienna, Austria, obviously has something in mind other than using the building as a source of comfort in response to weather and climate. What he's playing with here is this idea of cylinders of various diameters reflecting the surround, including the great cathedral in the Stephansplatz uh, of, of Vienna, to different uh, degrees of, of, uh, of magnification, where the, Im the images become tighter or looser or more expanded, depending on the diameter of the cylinder. Also, this little roof up here doesn't do much to hold the snow and the rain and the, and the sleet off things. Uh, it's there for uh, purely uh, symbolic reasons. While I think we could somehow justify um, that kind of design freedom with certain important buildings, I think that uh, buildings like, like the Disney Music Hall is one of them, where you don't worry so much about, how, about the environmental impact of this building. But there are hundreds, thousands, thousands of thousands, millions of thousands of buildings around the world that we should be worried about. This is housing in Eastern Europe. This is the south elevation of that building, but I can assure you that the north elevation looks exactly the same. How could that possibly be? The, the, the south elevation is the source of wintertime heat. The north elevation is a source of, the, of a loss of heat in the wintertime. If the two sides look exactly the same, what's going on? And the answer is that somebody's pouring off energy into this building to overcome those differences by flipping a switch, by controlling a thermostat, and so on. The result is a kind of monotony, a kind of uniformity that we can see as the buildings become, become multiplied. This, too, is housing in Eastern Europe. These are 13-story buildings. They're following uh, the Russian model of uh, precast concrete constructions. They all look pretty much alike. The wall of, one of uh, each building looks pretty much like the wall of the same building on another side. It doesn't respond to the directions of wind. It doesn't direction, respond to the direction of sun. There's a kind of uniformity that we, in fact, see now all over the world. There are certain social impacts on it, certain perceptual impacts on it, certain quality of life impacts on it. How do we tell under those circumstances when, where one building looks like, exactly like another building or pretty much like it, where the top of a building looks like the bottom of a building, where one unit looks like another unit, how do we tell left from right or up from down? That, too, is a design issue. And so is this. When people can't identify with their own place in the world, they may use methods of identification that can seem to others like an imposition. Again, what do we do about it? An answer I've been working on for most of my life is that we can depend on the sun as a source of energy. You are going to have to confront that issue. You are going to have to de decide whether you're going to use the sun or not. Are you going to continue to rely on systems that have been used for decades now? Or are you going to try to figure out a different way to build? If you're going to figure out a different way to build, there are going to be policymakers that are going to have to figure out a different way to organize a city. And one way to do that is to organize a city for access to sunlight. And one mechanism that I've been working on for some years is the solar envelope. It's no secret 
Tall buildings cast long shadows, and within those shadows it's difficult, if not impossible, to use the sun as a source of energy or enhance quality of life. And it is a, an issue of quality of life. That is another design issue. This is a swimming pool for a popular downtown hotel in Los Angeles. As you can see, there's a little strip of sunlight here, and most of the people are gathered there. There are a few brave holes over the, uh, distributed around the rest of the pool, but not very many. If that shadow moves to the right, these people go home. If it moves to the left, some more people may come out of the hotel to join them. So the issue of access to sunlight for energy and enhanced quality of life in the city is not just a spatial issue. It is, it is a, an issue of time as well. That was recognized traditionally by people. This is a settlement about 50 miles west of Albuquerque, New Mexico, called Acoma, A-C-O-M-A. -A. Sited on the top of a relatively small plateau. So space is at a premium. It's a row house arrangement in which the rows run long in the east-west direction and the houses all tear down and to the south. If we look at a partial cross section through one of those houses, it looks something like this. It's not the whole section, just cut away. The summer sun, as you saw with that Indian house, is very high in the sky and it shines most directly on these horizontal roof terraces. They're built of timber, of reeds, of grasses, materials that don't so easily transmit heat, store it, or transmit it to the inside. The winter sun, again, as you saw in that Indian house, is very low in the sky, and it comes in predominantly from the south. It shines most directly at these walls that are masonry. They store and transmit the heat inside much more effectively. So these houses are a kind of spatial temporal construction in response to sun for comfort. The question is, if one house is well designed, how do you arrange rows of houses? And the answer is, you stay out of each other's footprint. If this house gets any closer to this house, it's in the shadow and can't use the sun. If it gets any further apart, it uses up too much space on that limited plateau. That, in a nutshell, is the issue of solar access zoning in cities. It's to get things as close as possible together for the highest density, but without overshadowing each other. If we take this critical angle right here of the sun and transfer it into a modern context, we get a picture that looks like this. This is something called a solar plane. It's high on the southern edge, and it's low on the northern edge. And it intersects the top of something called a shadow fence. It's, an, it's a height above the property line to which we could overshadow our neighbor without unduly re restricting that neighbor's opportunity to use the sun. That takes care of the, of the guy on the north of us. But what about property owners on other sides? The morning sun comes in this way, and if we're going to provide solar access for this guy over here, we generate this facet. The afternoon sun comes in in the other direction and generates this facet. The result is this container, the largest container called a solar envelope that we can put on that site without overshadowing our neighbors. If we take that concept and apply it in a, more, a slightly more complex situation, we get something like this. this. This envelope has been generated to provide six hours of winter sunshine to all of the neighbors. But I said, I mentioned this, so this, uh, this shadow fence. The shadow fence could vary in its height depending on land use, depending on community values. For example, here the shadow fence drops all the way to the ground, suggesting that the neighborhood, the community, values access to the sun for this little park where children play for six hours of a winter day. But if you look across the corner here, diagonally, you can see the shadow fence has risen, meaning that the, suggesting that the community is less concerned about overshadowing a parking facility. Otherwise, the shadow fence runs fairly, con runs consistently here at some moderate height adj adjacent to uh, housing.
This is a study that we did some years ago for the Community Redevelopment Agency of Los Angeles. This site has now has since been uh, built up, but in those days, it was empty. <clears throat> it's Bunk Hill. And the Community Redevelopment Agency was interested in what would happen to the basic massing on this site if you were valued solar access. And to a high degree, that's exactly how they arranged it. You can see the envelope is high and it drops down. Where the surrounding buildings are high, the envelope rises. Where the surrounding buildings are low, the envelope drops. Especially critical in this case because this is housing for the elderly. If we take the envelope away and put a typical design in its place, this was one of a number of designs that were done. And incidentally, all the work that I'm going to show you now is, was done by undergraduate students in this school. Students at the third, fourth, and fifth year levels in what's called a topic studio, and I guess you still have topic studios. You can see the scaling effect of the solar envelope, high to high and low to low. This is a mixed-use mixed development containing shops, offices, and housing. But, dense, but how, uh, zoning is normally done not one site at a time. It's normally done by districts. So early on in our work, we looked at how uh, solar, uh, solar envelope zoning would affect an entire district at a time. You can see here, the envelopes are high on the south, low on the north. They, so they're dropping, rising, dropping, rising, dropping across the street here to shadow fences that are 20 feet high to provide for a base of street front commercial under housing. We take the envelopes away We can see some design features that result pretty consistently from this kind of zoning. Roof terraces, where the orthogonal geometry of construction meets the diagonal sloping geometry of the envelope. Courtyards, where volume has been cut away in order to provide cross ventilation and access to wet sunshine for every dwelling unit in the project. And incidentally, that is a condition for all the work I'm going to show you. It's essentially a condition of using, designing the building to work with nature and not against nature. And then the other thing, I think, is a kind of surface richness that results from taking the sun in in the wintertime, keeping it out in the summertime, taking the wind in for cross ventilation, uh, which is a necessary condition of good design. While the envelope rises and falls here, at side property lines, this second early study continues the envelope over side property lines. You can see that the envelope is running continuously here. It drops at back property lines and it drops across the street at front property lines, but it does not drop at the side property lines. We did this in order to find out if we could generate higher densities using row housing. The fact is we did get row housing but we also got cluster housing, courtyard housing, and even apartment housing because as the, as, the, as the streets changed orientation here, the envelope rises and falls, providing more height and more volume, therefore higher density in some situations. Once we felt that we had pretty well begun to understand how to apply the solar envelope to, a different, to different situations, we undertook what turned out to be a 10-year housing study. I'm going to show you only four, only four of the projects of that study. Beginning with this one, which is the lowest density study. There's a ridge of the hill that runs right through here. There's an east-facing slope over here and a west-facing slope over here. Because the sun can cast shadows in two directions across the streets in this case, the solar, the solar envelopes along this ridge turned out to be quite high. But if you look down at this west slope, you can see the impact of the solar envelope sloping downhill to protect existing housing further down the hill. You can also see uh, some characteristics of design here. Sunlight caught in clear stories and dropped into atria or winter gardens. Sunlight dropped down into stairwells. Sunlight caught uh, a south-facing garden, and so on. 
the density range in that last project was 7 to 18 dwelling units per acre. And I would remind you here that typical housing densities in California subdivisions are 5 to 7 dwelling units per acre. So we were slightly above that. And the reason we're always pressing for higher densities is because that's what building a city is all about. It's not about building a suburb. It's about how you build within a city. And this particular site is in Silver Lake within the city of Los Angeles. This is a second project. The density here has, been, has, raised, has, has risen. We're now up to, uh, 14 to, uh, up to 14 to 28 dwelling units per acre. Again, you can see the impact of the envelope sloping downhill. This slope is more gentle than the last one which accounts for higher density, and the slope flattens out further to the right, right in this picture. You can also see the designers working this south elevation, dropping sun down stairwells and so on to lower spaces in the house. If we move to the right here, we're now onto flat land. <coughs> the envelopes rise. And the designers were able to build quite tall townhouses here, three stories high, centered on, a, a, uh, on a, uh, an atrium or winter garden here, topped by a clear story, south-facing clear story. But as you move in this direction, the envelopes drop in their height so that by the time you get to here, this designer can no longer reach up for the sun. What she's done is cut volume away in order to get those critical south exposures. This project increases the density once again. We're now up to a range of about uh, 42 to 75 dwelling units per acre. In order to get those higher densities, we've had to make some considerable changes here. Number one, we changed the envelope rules. For those first two projects, we guaranteed six hours of winter sunshine. For this project, we're guaranteeing only four hours. That's the minimum required for good passive design, and it's a number that, uh, that you ought to keep in mind. If you're going to design with the sun and design for cross ventilation uh, and you're going to design for high densities, four hours of sunshine on a winter day is the minimum required for good design with the sun. You can see that the, in, the envelopes are dropping at side property lines, rop, riding, rising, dropping, rising, dropping, rising, dropping, and so on. We did that in this case because the winds are coming off the Pacific Ocean from the west. And these channels allow that wind to blow through, to ventilate, and to cool the rest of the city. The other change that we made was in the building type. The first two projects were about houses. This project is about apartments. And because the basic <coughs> apartment type in this country is a single, is a double loaded corridor where the corridor runs down the middle of the building with units on either side, making unequal access to the sun and making cross ventilation really, really very difficult, if not impossible, we went to European prototypes. This one up here in the upper left is by the Dutch architect Bakama. This one by the French architect Corbusier. I don't know whether those names are familiar to you at all, but certainly this French architect Corbusier will become familiar to you sooner or later. This one, this, this fellow is less well known, but the section turns out to be quite, uh, quite brilliant and quite useful. One unit goes down and under the, under the corridor, one unit is attached directly to the corridor, small efficiency, and I'll come back to that. And one unit goes up and over the corridor. So you get nine units attached to three corridors. And incidentally, I'm only going to use three corridors in all, all of these sections so we can compare them. Nine units attached to three corridors. The Corbusier section is somewhat less efficient. There are only six units attached to three corridors because there are two units attached to each corridor. One goes down and under, one goes up and over. Both of those sections, nonetheless, are very useful in an east-west exposure. But where the building faces north and south instead, the efficiencies in Bakama's section here that appeared on both sides of the building because the sun came at one side in the morning and the other side in the afternoon, here, when the building faces north and south, which is very often the case, all the efficiencies had to, shift, had to shift to the south face, meaning requiring some adjustments in here. 
Still, nine units attached to three corridors, where the, cor the adaptation to north-south for the, for the um, Corbusier section is much less efficient. Every unit has to be two stories high to get up and over the corridor for cross-ventilation without losing privacy into the corridor itself. Only three units attached to three corridors. Nonetheless, all of those units, all of those sections are useful in one circumstance or another, and we used all of them in these uh, projects. I'm showing this picture for two reasons. Well, one is uh, the solar envelope is a good neighbor policy. It protects the neighbor for solar access. It doesn't tell you yourself as a designer how you're going to use the sun. That's up to you. The sun is guaranteed to you, but how you use it is your problem. We're on the Spanish the diagonal Spanish grid here, incidentally. This designer, in order to get sunlight, wind sunlight into his own project, has split it open along a due north-south line. The, the site here is very narrow and it's very long. This site is broader across a southerly edge, not due south, but southerly. So she's able simply to open a, a large forecourt here to get sunlight into her own project. Incidentally, you can see the envelope is high over this part of her site and low over that part of her site, so she changes building type within her own property. This is the last uh, project in the sequence I'm going to show you, and it achieved the highest density we were able to achieve in the whole 10 years of work, 130 dwelling units per acre. To get those higher densities, we made one simple change in the envelope rules. Instead of the envelope rising and falling at side property lines, we ran the envelope continuously across side property lines. We could do that in this case because this is south, that's north. The west winds are coming off the Pacific in this direction, so we could polarize these buildings in this direction without interfering too much with the free flow of air. I'm going to move in on that south elevation to show you a couple of details. One is, <clears throat> what, here are these efficiency units that are projected out to capture more light and more air. Also, there are three projects here. There's one from here to there. There's another from here to here. There's a third from there to there. These two designers clearly are working together and they have a certain kind of idea about how they're going to work with that solar envelope. This designer worked rather independently and chose a different way to approach the envelope. This designer in the middle has quite a large site and quite a tall building and found it advantageous here in order to use all of the units possible in that building, keep the units in his front yard small so that the winter sun can come in over the top to get to these low units in his building. What I'm going to do now consistently is always move to the right. Look first at the eastern end of this project and pick up a couple of details. One is this kind of sawtooth here to admit the winter rays of the sun. The second is this little funny projection out here, kind of romantic, uh, somebody's idea of, uh, of uh, uh, actually a, a very good idea of how to get we uh, southern light into the northern portion of this building. And the third thing here is porches. Porches turn out to be a wonderful device for controlling the sun, on the, especially on the west and on the east, which are very difficult control problems. By playing the inside edge of the porch against the outside edge, edge of the porch with awnings, with sunscreens, and so on, you can get very effective sun control on those difficult situations. It's because of the of the, of the two boundaries here, the two, the two uh, chances for control. I'm going to move again to the right and look back at the north side of this building. And you can see how different it is from the south face. That's characteristic of designing with the sun. It's characteristic of designing with the wind. In other words, it's characteristic of design with nature. I'm going to move then now to look at this, this corner here. It turns out to be an interesting situation. The morning sun generates a facet of the solar envelope that drops down this way. The afternoon sun comes in from the west and generates a facet 
against this boundary. So what's happening here is that we're running out of building space. And the designers of this project used that as, as a reason to develop a stairway here that gets them from one level on this hillside to another level. This hill goes on down. It's quite relatively steep. This is an L-shaped building. And it comes along here and it turns. And I'm going to show you the other, the other corner of it right here. The morning sun comes in this way and generates an envelope against this boundary. The afternoon sun comes in this way and generates an envelope against that boundary. So the height at this two point, because this is a due north-south road, the height at, this two, at these two points is the same. Clearly, these two designs have different attitudes about how, about how to work within the envelope. I'm going to move again to the right. And I'm showing this picture because it's characteristic of designing with the sun. It's characteristic of solar envelope zoning. These are not houses, nor are they high-rise apartments. They average about three to seven stories high. It's not a scale that is characteristic of the way we traditionally built in this country, uh, but it's a, it's a characteristic of relatively dense cities and quite beautiful ones over much of the world. Again, moving to the right and looking back across this little park here, The morning sun comes in this way and generates an envelope against this boundary across the street. The afternoon sun comes in this way and generates this envelope across the street at this boundary. But it does not drop at the side property lines. That has a real advantage in density. You have more building volume to work with and therefore more density. But it would also suggest some kind of responsibility of designers to at least look at what each other is doing, which these two did not especially do. I don't even think they liked each other very much. But these two designers did. They worked together. They enjoyed working together. You can see that they use similar kinds of devices. The envelope over this portion, over this designer's site from here to here is relatively low. The shadow throw is only 20 feet across this alley. But that envelope that low envelope continues and then it rises at this point because there's a large open space here. The entry to the old red car system downtown is unbuilt upon and will never be built upon. So this, this building following the solar envelope can rise. You can see these typical characteristics that I mentioned before. Uh, roof terraces, courtyards, surface richness that results from designing with nature and these porches here that layer the space. Those characteristics show up in most of this work. Roof terraces that can be used as green, green roofs. They can be used for gardening, for small trees, vegetables, vegetables, flowers, attracting birds, bees, butterflies. Courtyards become another major landscaping element. And the kind of surface richness of design that results from working with nature. But while there are tremendous advantages to the kind of approach to solar access something that I've been describing, the solar envelope. Our more recent work has opened up another possibility. And that other possibility is called the interstitium. It's a term that I borrowed from human anatomy, the interstitial layer of the human lung that expands and contracts as we breathe. For example, there are three solar envelopes here. Winter envelope, the envelope for spring, fall, and the envelope for summer. They all have different sizes and different shapes, but they all provide exactly the same six-hour period of access to the sun. The question is, because most zoning limits is limited by this winter, this winter uh, angle of the uh, solar envelope, the question is whether, it will, whether we can't find some way some dynamic kind of approach to design that would allow us to use this additional space depending on the season of the year. For example, here's a site organized on the cardinal points of the cups following the U.S. Land Ordinance of 1785, where the streets run north, south, and east, west. Here's a sidewalk. 
This is the winter envelope, this dark red one here. It has a certain kind of shape that's relatively complex. There's the summer envelope, which is a, has a much simpler kind of shape because the geometry of the sun in relation to the Earth has changed. It's this space between the two that we're calling the interstitium, and it's that space that we're trying to learn how to design with. For example, if we take the attitude that the basic configuration of the building follows the winter envelope, is there some way that we could add on to that in the summertime? Here's this uh, very diagrammatically. There's the basic shape of the winter envelope. But in the summertime, we've added a theater on the rooftops here and a marquee. Or here, again, north is in this direction. The, 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 the winds off the Pacific Ocean are coming in this direction. There's the basic configuration of the envelope following of the, of, the, of, the, of the building following the, the uh, winter envelope. But here we raise wind scoops in the summertime and put a, put a toldo over this courtyard. Those things are there in the summertime and they disappear in the wintertime. Following that principle, we undertook a series of uh, site studies. <clears throat> this is a site... Um, in fact, it's the same site. We're following the U.S. Land, land Ordinance of 1785. We've got a street on the north and a street on the west. Private housing uh, properties on the other two sides. <coughs> because, <coughs> because we can cast long shadows across these streets, we would expect the envelope to be high on these two sides and lower on these two sides. In fact, if we look at these the shadow fences, what we're using here are 20 foot high shadow fences across the street because those are commercial properties. And we're using 10 foot high shadow fences on these two sides because this is housing. So we can cast shadows on these two sides, on the north and on the west, across the street and to the top of these 20 foot high shadow fences. Here, we can only cast shadows to the edge of the property and only to 10 foot high. This then, this red configuration is the winter envelope and the pale yellow one, the transparent one, is a summer envelope. If we look at that winter envelope in more detail, we, get, we, we, we see what we would expect to see. It's high on north and on the west and it's low, it's low or dropping down on these other two sides. It's because the sun in the wintertime is coming from the south, the south edge is not as critical. That's why it's not dropping down to this 10-foot high shadow fence. If we take that envelope away and put that very diagrammatically a building mass in its place, we get something that looks like this. The building is high on these two sides and it's lower on these two sides. This is, again, diagrammatically an outline for a, uh, for a mid-rise uh, courtyard office building. It's in its winter mode. The courtyard is open. If you use a little imagination, you can see trees in here. You can see uh, maybe some water features in here. You can see gardens in here, uh, flowers, uh, <coughs> uh, coffee tables, and so on, where people uh, can come out of their office spaces uh, to enjoy out the out of doors. The morning sun comes in from this direction and casts a shadow in that direction. The afternoon sun comes in this way so simply by migrating back and forth across this space, people can ha will always have their choice of either sun sunlight or shadow. And it's that choice that is, that is somehow basic to, I think, to all good design. This then is that basic configuration, but under, under the summer envelope. And it's this space, this interstitial space between the two that I'm going to talk about. Here is the toldo. It has a rather complex uh, configuration, and even at that, it's only diagrammatically shown. It rises on the west and drops on the east, staying under that, solar, that summer solar envelope. This will not be here in the summertime. It, in the wintertime, it will be there in the summertime. It does two things simultaneously. It captures the westerlies coming off the Pacific Ocean, 
to channel them down into the space for ventilation. And it keeps, it's designed precisely to keep the, sun, the summer sun out of that courtyard. <coughs> we can then imagine, just as in the Spanish courtyard under the toldo, with the toldo closed, the whole quality of the space changes. Light is subdued, the shadows disappear, the bright sun disappears. People behave in a different way. Their pattern movements change. Their rituals of life alter. We can imagine then a kind of landscape, a whole urban landscape with a low undulating profile in the wintertime. An additional layer of architectural space to work with in the spring fall. And still a third layer in the summertime so that the whole landscape rises and falls, rises and falls like breathing. This is precisely what I'm not talking about. It's the New York skyline. And I think we can ask certain basic questions about it. I happen to know it's New York, but it might be Hong Kong. It might be Shanghai. It might be London. Where is it? That's a critical question. And if it looks like all those other places, why does it look like all those other places? What time is it? What is its basic rhythm? What is its basic life? We could be refrigerating this part of the building while we're heating that part of the building. If we can't answer those kinds of questions, we have to think again. And you, as future architects, have to think again about our strategies for policy and design. Thank you very much. Are you willing to uh, take some questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay.